Well, I'll, I'll get started with a short introduction. We'll have folks trickling in. Um, so grateful for everyone tuning in today for being a part of this conversation around the future of healthcare. Uh, this is a part of a new statewide series that Ohio X is working on in conjunction with Jobs Ohio. Uh, we're grateful to the four leaders that will be joining us today that you'll be hearing from uh, around this important topic. I think we all saw 2020 was a massive year of disruption. Uh, it changed how we live, how we work, and, and certainly in the healthcare sector uh, for people in hospital systems, research institutions, first responders, doctors and nurses. Uh, they, were, they, they are and have been on the front lines for many, many months, and for that we're, we're very grateful. And so uh, as we begin, uh, just a little bit about Ohio X for those that perhaps aren't aware. Uh, I'm Chris Berry, president of Ohio X. I'll be hosting today. We are a statewide technology and innovation partnership uh, with a mission of helping build Ohio into a leading tech hub. Uh, what we do is we connect, promote, and advocate for technology and innovation in the state of Ohio uh, and hopefully help uh, tell the story both within Ohio and then outside of Ohio. Uh, we've been around for just one year. We have over 90 members, about 100 at this point. Uh, our member organizations and companies represent uh, and employ over 70,000 Ohioans. And hopefully uh, one voice we're working towards of, of telling the tech story here in the state. Some of our members, which you'll hear from today, uh, some of the world's largest, most uh, innovative companies. Uh, we also include some of Ohio's most exciting startups that are growing and scaling um, and all sorts in between, but uh, a group of organizations, companies, and leaders that are dedicated to tech and innovation in the state uh, and what it can mean for our economy and opportunities for Ohioans. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about Ohio X, you can go to uh, any of our socials. So we're on LinkedIn at Ohio X, on Twitter at OhioX.org, also on YouTube at, at Ohio X, and our website is uh, www.OhioX.org. And so today, uh, we are uh, part of a conversation with four leaders. This is, as I mentioned, the Future of series. So it's a 2021 year long. And John, I, I see you officially joined via video. So we're all good. Uh, apologies to, to those of us joining us. This has been one of those fun Zoom issues of, uh, you know, we're all trying to figure out work from home and technology behind it, which works for 99% of the time. But today was one of those 1%. <laughs> so uh, the Future Of series, it's a year long series uh, where we are every month going to be looking at different sectors and industries across the state, what it means for the future, how technology, how innovation are playing a role in shaping them. And most importantly, how the Ohio people, companies and ideas are playing an active leading role in that. And so today, this is the future of healthcare. Uh, we're incredibly grateful, I must say, before we start to our partner and uh, in putting this on Jobs Ohio, Ted and the entire team have been absolutely fantastic in, in helping make this possible. And so this is the first one. Every month we'll be looking at something different and Jobs Ohio and their partnership and the work they're doing uh, well beyond this, this one series. Uh, is, is so important for Ohio and, and tech as we think about uh, building a stronger tech sector. I'm going to hop in now. Uh, what we'll do is introductions for our four guests uh, and the leaders. We'll hear about them and who they are. I'll do a short, short bio of each of them. Pause for a moment, allow each of them to share a little bit more about who they are, the work they're doing, and the perspective that they'll bring to this conversation. After that, we're going to hop into our conversation today. Uh, and this is going to be really fun. We have a, a bunch of stuff teed up that we'll get into and dig into. Um, but one thing that I do uh, uh, welcome is uh, the chat bar on the right hand side. You should be able to chat, uh, put in questions. If you hear something, uh, feel free to, to throw it in there and, and say where you're from, because we have people attending today from all over Ohio, from all sorts of different organizations. And then I suspect also probably a few from outside of Ohio. So uh, we're incredibly grateful for everyone attending. Uh, and, and I'm especially grateful for our four leaders. So I'm gonna start with uh, Margaret Barquette for the Associate Director of Technology Commercialization from Nationwide Children's Hospital here in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, Nationwide Children's is America's second largest children's hospital. The Abigail Wexner Research Institute at Nationwide Children's Hospital is one of the top 10 NIH funded pediatric research facilities in the United States. Margaret, thank you so much for being here. And if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about uh, yourself and, and the work that you all are doing at Nationwide Children's. 
and I think you might be on mute. There you go. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on this panel. Uh, so I'm Margaret Barquet. I'm the Associate Director of the Office of Technology Commercialization at Nationwide Children's Hospital, where we manage intellectual property developed at our in research institution and the hospital. We license our technologies to established companies as well as startups. So our team works at the intersection of innovation and commercialization. We facilitate the transfer of new technologies, research and innovations to outside partners in the commercial sectors. Uh, our technologies span the spectrum ranging from therapeutics to med devices to IT solutions and diagnostics. Thank you, Margaret. We really appreciate you joining us and uh, all the work that uh, Nationwide Children's does every day. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll also add that my sister's a, a nurse there, so uh, I love following along and, and I know she loves working there. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, up next, we have uh, Charlie Lohit, who is the founder and CEO of Actual. Uh, he's out of Cleveland and his company, they provide technology that is a digitally secure network that connects credential holders, issuers, subscribers, enabling the more efficient deployment of human capital into critically important settings like healthcare. Uh, Charlie was also a co-founder and co-funded Explorus, which is now IBM Watson Health in 2009, which was a spinoff from Cleveland Clinic. So Charlie, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Chris. It's good to be here. Looking forward to today's conversation. Yeah, I actual digitizes professional credentials. So just like an ID card uh, proves who you are, a digital credential proves what you've done, your credentials, your qualifications. And this is really important for healthcare because it speeds up the process of deploying medical professionals to the field, which is good. It's good for patients because it addresses delays in access to care. It's good for clinicians because they wanna work. They wanna practice medicine faster, especially when the need is great around things like COVID. And it's good for healthcare organizations because it helps them meet their operating goals. I think one of the most important and exciting things to remain to today's conversation is that this is another example of technology and innovation that was built here in Ohio. We developed this with five leading healthcare organizations most notable, notably University Hospitals that work with, did with David and his team, Metro Health, Higher Medical, again, all here in Ohio. And I think it speaks volumes that we can do innovation in this region and it can be world, uh, it could be, it could be world leading. And I think uh, in, in summary, I think what's gonna be really interesting today is just really talking about how these technologies uh, begin to change the landscape of the future work in healthcare. So I'm really happy to be here today. Well, thank you, Charlie. Uh, and uh, you mentioned a, a bunch of great partners up in the Cleveland area that we know as well. And uh, it, it is, I, I would echo that. It's so incredibly exciting to see the work you're doing and the tie-in between different hospital systems and other technology companies uh, that are building and growing and scaling right here. So uh, looking forward to learning more as, as we dive more into today's conversation. Uh, but next up is John Lewis, who is the president and CEO of Bio Ohio. Bio Ohio is Ohio's bioscience organization, and they connect and serve Ohio's bioscience community to drive success in improving global quality of life. During the last 13 years, John, Bio Ohio, and their affiliates have helped raise more than $1.3 billion for Ohio healthcare entities and have helped attract and start more than 350 companies in the state. John, thank you for being here, and uh, it is absolutely great to see you, not just hear you. Uh, yeah, what, what a great kickoff to 2021 and my gosh, we're already almost through January. What the heck? Um, yeah, Bio Ohio has been around for 33, uh, and we're into our 34th year um, as a resource to the biomedical bioscience community. Um, and for us, that's everything med device, Diagnostic, drugs and pharmaceuticals, healthcare IT. You know, glad to have. Uh, you know, we, we've had eight founding members a long time ago. David, you're one of them at UH. Um, Case, the clinic, Ohio State, Patel, um, University of Cincinnati, OU. Um, oh my gosh, it's been a great run and. Um, I think the best thing to think of us, uh, as I think I've met all of you, is we're just a resource to companies, institutions, regardless of size, scale, growth. Um, we have 
uh, elements that uh, kind of promote in, in 2020 was one of the most uh, greatest years ever um, for helping Ohio. And Ohio kind of pushed through and we're still pushing through. So um, as you'll hear some more as, as Chris kind of uh, moderates through some questions, um, I just have to open up with, it was an amazing privilege to be uh, at Bio Ohio um, during last year. Um, I've been here for 20 years, I mean, my 21st year. Uh, this was the great, last year was the greatest year ever in terms of uh, my heart and what I was able to do and what we as an organization were able to do for Ohio companies and Ohio patients because ultimately it's about the patients and the people. So it was, uh, I have nothing but uh, honor and privilege to what I've done uh, in the past, but last year was amazing. <laughs> so we'll get into details, Chris. Uh, I don't wanna get it all sappy. Uh, so that's it, I'm stopping. Well, thank you, John. And uh, I echo that as it was incredible to see the, the healthcare, the, the medicine, medical community come you know, do, do what everyone did. And it, uh, um, you know, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a great reminder. So I appreciate you sharing the kind of passion behind it because uh, a lot of people are, are still every day working really hard on it. And uh, that, that shouldn't go unnoticed and unthanked. So thank you for, for raising that side of it. But uh, up next, our, our, our fourth and uh, final guest is David Sylvan, who's the president of University Hospitals Ventures out of the Cleveland area. Uh, UH is one of the nation's leading healthcare systems, and they are Northeast Ohio's second largest private employer. UH Ventures, which David runs, works with both innovators, both inside and outside of university hospitals to more effectively deliver value and vitality to, our, to their hospital, their patients, and their community. David, thank you so much for joining us. Chris, thanks for, uh, for having me, and I'll keep it brief. Uh, a lot of what we do is very similar to that of what Margaret stated. We are a combination of innovation and corporate venture capital platform. Uh, we look to give commercial life to opportunities that we source and spawn within our organization. Uh, by the same token, we also look to partner with uh, strategic entities from outside who can solve for a well-defined, well-articulated pain point, and certainly actual is one a very current example of exactly that need. We're also responsible for the uh, influencing the culture of innovation within our organization. We do that through a variety of uh, programmings, um, for example, Innovation Days, the, the, the attempt to look to nurture more invention and innovation from our community, from our ecosystem, as well as our colleagues, and not just clinical. And uh, of course, we have the capacity then to invest where that makes strategic sense and would be accretive to our broader mandate. So looking forward to today's conversation and certainly echo uh, a lot of what John had to say at the opening. Thank you, David. Really appreciate that. So to open, and I think, John, maybe we can start with you because your comments are a good I think, segue into uh, when we talk about healthcare, COVID, and what the past year or so has just brought to our world. and. Uh, people involved in this conversation, your organizations, the companies across the state uh, have been front and center and each and every single day fighting this thing and, and developing the technologies and, and the research and development to get vaccine. And just from start to finish, it's been absolutely incredible. But uh, how did the work, do you think, over the course of the year change from previous 2018, 2019, uh, as, as disruption happened in every sense of the word. So what, what has that evolution been like to, to you, John, and, and the companies and organizations that you work with? John, I think you're on mute. There it is. Thank you. Um... You know, we, you know, we, we play a, a bifurcated role. We're a trade association. So we know what all, all, many of you are going through. And then we also have our own issues as um, just as a, as a supporter, as a resource to you. So, um, you know, I'd say there's three really quick points 
and I, you know, I applaud Chris. As you'll see, as all of you here, he has some great, great questions for all of us, and we, we want to really get through them because um, they're really helpful. But you know, one thing we all, many of us, had to work remote. So how do you do that? Well, I have to applaud our board um, for I don't know, ten or fifteen years ago for um, putting into place in our organization at BioOhio remote access. So when we had to go remote, it was actually seamless. So I have to give a lot of thought to people like University Hospitals, Cleveland Clinic, Ohio State, Battelle, and so many of our members and, and you know, Cardinal Health and big, big members, small members that said, give your employees uh, flexibility. This was a long time ago. I didn't appreciate it then. I certainly did in 2020. So I think that was really uh, seamless. Um, yes, we missed each other. Certainly the uh, type A extroverted ones uh, in our group are, you know, struggling like all of you are that are type A and extroverted. Um, the other big change was obviously we had to go to virtual events as a trade association. And I have to thank our event coordinator, our event director, Scott Clay, for having um, an amazing insight into this industry and helped us navigate and became one of the leaders in the coal country um, with other organizations like us, they turned to Scott. So um, we, we, what does that mean? And we can, we might get into that a little bit later, but you know, we're all on these Zoom calls and they cannot be like totally boring because you can't have 25 Zoom boring calls. Um, but I have to say overall in 2020, the rest of our business was normal. We're a resource to you. And the exciting part was so many companies that for example, had financing, that had passion, but didn't have the idea or, or the expertise to how to get a, a PPE product into the market or a, sanit, you know, a sanitizer product into the market, but they had everything else. So they needed guidance, mentoring, and that's what ESPs do around the state. That's what we help guide them to. So that's why I say it was, it was an amazingly exciting um, experience year last year and a privilege for me and our whole team to be there um, because we were able to help Ohio accelerate faster than other places around the world um, because of the networking and the stuff that we had. So I would say the disruption um, and obviously companies are uh, company specific. We have some that have suffered but many that have um, exceeded their wild, wildly expected budgets um, because they're, they're in a place that helps Ohio's people and patients and all of us. So it's been a really, really cool place. So it's a, there's multiple areas there. Thank you, John. And David, I'll go to you next. Uh, and, and John mentioned having to do it virtual. Um, and I remember you and I first met uh, about a year ago and our first meeting was supposed to be in person, which then got switched to virtual because of this thing we were hearing and it's spreading and trying to keep people safe. But, uh, you know, how did, how did from those early days until now, um, what, did, what did that year look like at university hospitals and for a venture team uh, that was trying to, to help the, the doctors and nurses that are at your, at your uh, institutions? Yeah, great, uh, great question, Chris. You know, it doesn't hurt having your your bed and your desk 12 feet apart from each other, right? It makes for an easy commute and a longer day. And, you know, I have to tell you, I couldn't be prouder of a team that, that willingly leaned in for this collective effort. You know, what changed for us, the, the material change for us was that we were activated from an all hands perspective in order to lean into all things PPE and to partner with our supply chain at the behest of our unified command. You know, we were fortunate to have leaders with experience in disaster response and they literally stood up a unified 
command construct within a day. And um, by design, the, the team embarked upon this, this PPE journey uh, in a non-traditional manner. We immediately reached into our ecosystem, whether that were our uh, manufacturing uh, uh, collaborators or market or the makerspace specifically to kick multiple work streams into play. And this was for the design of um, the testing and of the production of anything from face shields to intubation boxes to um, creatively reconfiguring scuba masks for, for ventilators. And so in terms of our region, to, to some extent uh, echoing what John said, I'd love to acknowledge the likes of Magnet, um, Eaton Corporation, uh, Case Western Reserves Thinkbox. These were critical partners to us, as well as you know, NASA Glenn for their partnership with us and all things uh, decontamination. All that said, um, we never wavered from our existing and non-COVID deliverables, you know, when it came to product development, to uh, new technology incubation, early stage investment diligence and funds deployment. We, we kicked pilots into play with the likes of Actual and others, and in fact, generated a higher cumulative output than originally envisioned. So uh, extremely proud of, uh, of that collective effort. And um, it's always gratifying when you see, um, see what people are willing and capable of doing when, uh, when uh, uh, you know, trauma forces you into those types of situations. Thank you, David. And, and Margaret, I'd love to turn to, to you and something David was mentioning of uh, the output still uh, being so vitally important. And uh, while there's one big thing that's on the top of all of our minds, uh, th there's still work to be done in a million other areas and keeping focus there uh, to still advance since advanced technology and advanced science. So what was it like at Nationwide Children's? So, yeah. Um, so I'm just going to um, concentrate on our office of technology commercialization, not the hospital. Um, so we had no significant change. Actually, we, we learned to work very effectively together as a team with our internal and external clients. So that wasn't a major um, shift. Uh, we did see early on in the pandemic some hesitation by some of our licensing partners, delaying decisions on licensing, but that was very transient. I'm not sure, David, if you saw that. But quickly, I think the biotech and investment community rebounded from that initial hesitation due to COVID. Uh, actually, just like with David, we had a record year in terms of licensing activity in our office by our team, um, recognizing we were on a positive trajectory from year to year, but it is noteworthy that COVID did not impact our trajectory. So um, again, I'm, I'm happy that our team did a great job. Great, thank you, Margaret. And, and Charlie, we'll, we'll I think this is a good segue from the past of, of this, you know, this past year that we all lived through uh, to, and this is what the today's event is largely looking forward. Um, and you're, you've been in health tech and working at startups and you're doing one now. Uh, startups by nature are trying to disrupt things, bring disruption to sectors and industries. So what was it like doing what you do with startups and bringing new technologies to the table in a year of disruption like we've never seen before. Here we go. Yeah, Chris, I would tell you that it was uh, a unique experience for me. Uh, startups are one of those things where oftentimes uh, you either improve upon something that's already out there or you create a new category and we're kind of in between that. And what that, what's that mean? It, it, it's, you know, the Zoomification of the whole business development and research and development process is, is something that it's hard to adjust to. Uh, you need to be able to innovate. Uh, you normally do that in person with whiteboards and just conversations and human beings love to be in the same room together. So changing that and adapting that is something we had to do. Uh, our, our, you know, our friends at University Hospitals and Metro and MedStar and other places had to do as well. And so that was, that was a challenge. It was hard to do. I think the other thing too is anytime you're a startup, you're, you're, you're not only asking your team to trust in what, in the future of the business and, and take that leap of faith, you're also asking your customers to do it too. Uh, and this is something that I think a lot of times people take for granted, the, the, the personal and business risk that the, the people who work in large corporate or large institutions 
they take risks when they get behind a startup. And those risks are something that are, uh, that their trust is something that's earned over time. And it's a lot easier to do when you're in person. So it just raises the stakes and raises the bar a little, makes it a little bit harder, obviously not impossible, but you know, using these electronic mechanisms to build relationship and build trust is something that I think everybody's, it's taken some time to get used to. And, you know, in some degree, I think we're not going completely back to the old way. Uh, but, you know, I think it, it, it definitely changes the dynamic of, of startups. Thank you, Charlie. Um, that's a good, as we looked at last year, one big area that uh, as, as consumers of healthcare and patients uh, was telehealth, where before chances are you were most likely going in to see your doctor, but sometimes out of necessity, sometimes out of preference, uh, people were starting to do telehealth more. And that's just one example of innovation there. And a statistic that I had come across was McKinsey said over the summer that they believe that uh, $250 billion of, of US healthcare spend could be virtualized at, at some level. And as we talk about telehealth specifically, that 11% of patients were using telehealth in 2019, where 76%, once we got into the pandemic, thought it was something that they could or, or would be interested in. And so, David, I'll, I'll kick it over to you to kind of uh, maybe dig into this a little bit. But as we look about healthcare being uh, virtualized, things like telehealth, you know, what are, what, are, what are your takes on it? And what are you seeing as you're looking at all these new ventures across the space, either from outside the, the hospital system or from those that are being built within? Sure, Chris. You know, the traditional models were completely upended last year. You know, we went from, you know, a disproportional reliance on in-person encounters. Uh, and that implied, therefore, only hundreds of virtual encounters to your stats, uh, you know, to literally tens of thousands every couple of weeks or so. And, and that genie is not getting, you know, going back in the bottle. The volume might not be sustainable or, or practical. I mean, some patients are gonna, you know, seek to reestablish in-person consultations as they, as they should be able to. Um, but there's no question that we have to be able to meet the patient where they most desire treatment up to and including their homes. And that's gonna pivot our focus with regards to our sort of technolo technology you know, search and sourcing. You, you quoted McKinsey, I'll quote Forrester. I think that they indicated that by the end of last year, there were gonna be a billion virtual visits. And I think that mark was, uh, was uh, I think we outkicked our coverage in that regard. But there is an alarming projection when you pass, uh, when you pass that number. It's expected that a full third of all virtual visits moving forward are gonna be related to mental health issues, which again forces us to think about where are the unmet needs. Um, there's no way that we as an industry and it's going to be driven by our patients as consumers and their preferences will allow us to fully revert back to the delivery, you know, pre-pandemic. So telehealth, remote, remote monitoring, they're here to stay. Uh, and this could end up actually being, a, a, in, in our mind, an existential challenge for some of those provider systems or um, perhaps smaller rural hospitals. Um, who are either not able to or choosing not to, to lean into the shift. And uh, in fact, probably as a result, we might be able to see a, a fair amount more consolidation as a result. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you, David. Um, Margaret, I'll, I'll go to you for, and you're welcome to uh, lean into the, the virtualization or telehealth specifically, but I'd be curious uh, over the past year, what, if you saw any evolution in your work in technology commercialization at the hospital? And did it change over the past 400 or 500 days? No, not, I, not much, no. Uh, but I wanna do, I do wanna comment on the telehealth uh, at Children's. Um, so before COVID, telehealth was on the radar of our information technology team. And uh, they were planning a very slow rollout. They were planning about four clinics. Due to the COVID, COVID accelerated a planned rollout. Uh, so instead of rolling out four clinics, they rolled out 55 clinics uh, as of May or August of 2020. And again, um, to David's comment, the highest volume was in behavioral health. 
because of course one it's amenable to telehealth applications um one thing we saw that there was um, a negative side of covid there was an increase uh, of those behavioral health visits because they're re related to covid related anxiety and mental health issues but on the positive side what we saw the increase in the behavioral health uh, clinic was um it allowed us to reach communities that we initially did not have access to, to them. So it was, there's a negative and a positive side. The other thing that also is, is seen is that there's, it highlighted the socioeconomic barriers. Still remain a challenge. People don't have internet access. So there, this is something that needs to still be addressed in the future. The second highest volume in terms of clinic uh, is, the, is the speech therapy. So basically between speech therapy and behavioral health, about 80% of our tel telehealth visits are in those two categories. Thank you. Uh, John, curious if, if your work has uh, kind of seen this as well, and I assume it has, or if there's any other nuggets you might want to offer about the, whether it's again telehealth or just this virtualization of, of healthcare. And John, I think mute. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, absolutely. Um, not with Bio Ohio, <laughs> unless we're a consumer, uh, but our members, amazingly. Um, I loved, or I shouldn't say I loved, that's the wrong term. Early on, let's say April, May, there were some, you know, the Cleveland Clinic, UH, David there, and Ohio State, so many others said, oh my gosh, in two months, more has happened in telehealth than in the last 10 and 20 years. Um, it got accepted. So it is here. It is here to stay. Um, and the cool part, at least for uh, uh, from a consumer, I think is um, doctors are accepting it too. They said, yeah, there's not a lot of, there's some things I can do just remotely with you. So that's a really cool thing. Like, like Margaret said, yeah, there, there are definitely things around mental health and speech therapy that really are front and center, but it's here to stay. Um, now, from an opportunity standpoint, you know, you had an Ohio company in Columbus, UpDocs, acquired on Christmas Eve. Um, you know, if you, if you logged into the University of Cincinnati or UH or the clinic or Ohio State, you had two or three or four different op options for telehealth related um, appointments. UpDocs was one of them um, and they were acquired. So that's, and they're gonna stay in Ohio, which is a great thing. And they're expanding in Ohio, which is a great thing. But I think from an opportunity standpoint though, this telehealth and think of any of you on the call that had an appointment or maybe your parents or grandparents had an appointment a lot of times when you go to the doctor, you had your health care, your, your, your caregiver. It could be a spouse, a friend, a neighbor, somebody was there. Telehealth was not able to deal with that still in a big way. So there's an amazing opportunity to add that. And it's not like there's somebody right here next to my head in the same room no, 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 we're talking about a third party in a different place that can be part of your healthcare continuum. So I think there's still amazing opportunities for healthcare. And I'll get to the future stuff, Chris, um, which I think is really exciting too. But telehealth is here to stay. I, I welcome it. I think it's it's been great for me personally. But oh, oh my gosh, it's been, I think it's super for many companies. But they have to understand that industry. So, thank you, John. And Charlie would be curious your perspective on, on this. And then um, maybe in addition to, as we, we move on to some other questions, you had mentioned earlier about higher medical and actual and the work you all are collaboratively doing, um, which is a really fascinating innovation. So maybe it's a two-part question. If one, you wanna, if anything you wanna add on this telehealth, but then two, if maybe you wanna showcase some of the innovative work that you're doing with different partners at UH and, and higher and, and et cetera. Chris, yeah, I, you know, I just to add on to the telehealth 
uh, discussion, I agree with all the points that were just made. I mean, the reality is it's consumers demand channel expansion. And this is the case with every industry. And we get financial services 20 years ago. I mean, I, most people stood in line at the bank. Now they do their online banking. Uh, most people went to the store and bought things and brought them home. Now they shop online and it gets delivered to their home, right? So healthcare is a little bit behind that and different than that. But there's channel expansion happening here. There's no question. And telehealth is one of those things where it's not for every, every situation or every specialty, obviously. But there's a lot that can be done with regards to preventative care and whatnot. But just like those other industries I described, when people started using the internet a lot to do shopping and other things, guess what started happening? Our infrastructure started to feel the pressure. And that's where companies like Cisco and others came in and said, we're gonna solve some of these infrastructure fail issues so that people can do more online. You look at healthcare, there are a lot of infrastructure issues. Now, granted, a lot of the technology and the network infrastructures, as far as moving bits around the network, that was solved or with, with other industries. But there's an infrastructure issue that's, that is, we're focusing on, on addressing inside of healthcare that really deals with the people infrastructure. Telehealth is one of those things where if you're a physician or a nurse practitioner, go back five years ago, you probably practiced in one or two, three states at the most. Now, if you practice telehealth, you're encouraged to practice and have licenses in as many as 25, 30, 50 states. And guess what that's doing to the infrastructure? Every one of those states, those license, those, those, those license bureaus and medical boards are inundated with requests. Everybody's asking the same information. I mean, heck, it used to take, and still does to, to a large degree, about 100 days to get someone through the credentialing process, a physician from start to finish. That's a lot of time. It's a lot before they can practice. It's a long time to wait. But now think about how much harder it is. Now you don't have to just check one or two state licenses. You got to go check 25. Think hey, Charlie, that. Charlie, I think that's great. I think what an amazing point about an opportunity. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, for some of our from some of our docs, but they have to go state to state, don't they? Yeah, it's it's, it's changed overnight. I mean, if you think about how fast I mean, it's, healthcare is being forced to, into hyperspeed here to adjust to some of these infrastructure challenges. So what That's happens if my like my my mother in law in Florida wants a telehealth visit from somebody in Ohio? I don't think she can do it. It depends on the state laws, but typically it's you have to be licensed in Ohio with a, or in the state where the patient is. Right. So, so. Yeah, it, it creates, and there's things that the industry is trying to do to standardize some of these things, but we need an internet of credentials, right? We need that uh, because in many ways, healthcare is the future of work. I mean, it, it, it's eight, what is almost 20% of our GDP. That means a lot of people work in it. Well, a lot more can work in it. And if you look at things like home health, now it's going to get it's going to proliferate even further. So, you know, it it it's going to be a really interesting space in the next few years. Well, thank you, Charlie. That that was fantastic, and that's a good way, uh, a good segue into uh, credentialing. And you're using blockchain, and there's obviously things like artificial intelligence, which Olive, which is another big growing startup in, in Columbus and in Central Ohio, uh, they're they're doing AI with their uh, some of their uh, some of their work, and I, I think the the number was like they raised recently two hundred plus million dollars for their for their last round. There, and they've just it's incredible to see uh, that happening here. But uh, may, again, Charlie, maybe a good opportunity to start with you of using some of these emerging technologies, and we could do a round robin again of whether it's blockchain or AI, and you can talk about the work you're doing, or maybe a, a case study you've seen somewhere else. But how are some of these emerging technologies allowing some of this innovation to take place in the health space? Well, Chris, yeah, I mean, AI has certainly done a lot in healthcare. is a long way to go. And we were really involved with Explorers in the last company with Watson Health and artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I think there's a lot of opportunities. So excited to see, exciting to see what's going on with Olive here in Ohio. So uh, you know, that, that offers such a huge opportunity. We've been focusing on blockchain uh, and a lot of times people think blockchain, oh, does that mean cryptocurrency? Not at all. Uh, but what the interesting thing about blockchain is, is that blockchain does something that frankly has been done manually for centuries, many centuries, which is a distributed, a distributed verification of proof. Meaning uh, I will have a ledger in one place and another place and if those ledgers match, 
it is true. And so what, it, what blockchain is able to do is provide a network of proof. And that is gonna have profound implications in a lot of areas. Digital credentials is one, right? There's no reason, as long as you can verify the authenticity of a, of a medical degree, there's no reason to go back to the medical school over and over and over again to verify that. If you have a, a mechanism, a network of proof, that's done once and it can be reused over and over again. But there's other areas. Uh, provider directories, being able to figure out what providers practice when, what hours, if they're accepting new patients, what days of the week there's certain, certain offices. That's a really big problem, a multi-billion dollar problem for healthcare. That's an example where a network of proof can make a lot of sense. Look at claims processing. I mean, look at healthcare in general. You know, close to a third of every dollar is administrative or waste. That's a lot of dough. And if we can figure out ways to use technology to reduce a lot of the redundancy, particularly that is, that isn't needed, we not only reduce the cost and the time it takes to get stuff done, but we also can raise the bar for things like safety. Today, credentialing, for instance, is mostly about do you have a medical license or not, or do you have, uh, or do you have a few uh, uh, adverse events or sanctions against you? But it really doesn't get into the qualitative things. And again, we've all seen resumes and we've looked at it and said, okay, this looks really good on paper, but is this for real? What digital credential and blockchain provides the ability to do is to know that it is quantitatively real and qualitatively real. And I think that's gonna have some pretty imp big impacts. And that's what we focused on. A lot of the pilots is developing that so that we can figure out how do we not only get through the process faster, and we took a process that took months to minutes, uh, but how do we do it in a way that raises the bar from a safety standpoint? Because we have to have that. That's fantastic. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, Margaret, I'll, I'll uh, offer an opportunity for you to hop in here and, and sure, yeah. add anything else you'd like to Yeah, so our hospital, just to kind of say again, uh, they use data analytics to um, leverage that data analytics to improve and have an impact on, on outcome. So for example, they use AI, they focus um, using uh, data analytics focused on identifying high risk asthmatic patients that are prone to readmission to the emergency department. So the results are to use to mitigate that risk and aim for better outcomes. So they identify these patients, they try to have preventive measures so that those patients would not come back to the hospital. That's one example that we have that has been implemented for a couple of years now. And in terms of blockchain, we, we have not been, it hasn't been picked up at, at Children's yet. Thank you. David? Well, I'd, I'd like to start by saying, imagine if Charlie was passionate about his topic, you know, imagine how, uh, you know, how successful he might be then. But, uh, and Charlie is my case study with regard to the use of, of uh, and potential adoption of blockchain as an underlying to solve for a problem. But as Charlie pointed out to me very early in our conversations, uh, don't think about the enablement, think about how we get to the outcome and uh, there might be a variety of technology enabled paths to get there. In this particular case, it happens to be blockchain, but in every respect and certainly not merely in, in clinical settings, we like to think about the, the stake and the sizzle associated with, with AI and VR, XR, et cetera. You know, surgical robotics and decision support, you know, and diagnostics and image recognition, et cetera. I think the biggest lift for healthcare systems is something that Charlie alluded to. It's the elimination of, of waste and redundancy. And so, you know, in order to get impact to flow directly to patient costs and issues like access and, and inequities and uh, the adoptions of technologies for the right reasons, I think we should, and we are beginning to focus more on the proverbial back office, the business of healthcare. You know, think administrative functions like supply chain and rev cycle and central billing, et cetera. And these are areas that are ripe for disruption and uh, with the likes of robotic process automation, et cetera. Um, for us, it's really gonna be a, a pretty relentless focus on, on eliminations of inefficiencies and waste, Chris. Thank you, David. Uh, John, anything that you'd like to add? And I'm sure you've, uh, between all the different member organizations from startups to hospital systems research that you've probably come across some interesting, interesting things in, in this emerging tech space. Well, uh, yes, and but I think it's it's been said really well uh, already. Um, data data analytics is here. It's real. It's been here for a long time. 
Obviously, we got Charlie, and you know, I was going to say about Explorers, but he already mentioned it. It's here, um, and the cool thing is, it's it is about um, efficiency, cost savings. Um, that's what the better data does. But what's the end goal? The end goal is always about better patient outcomes and better patient experience. So uh, does it, it all kind of feeds into that better, better patient experience and better patient outcomes at the end of the day. So yeah, it's here, it has been here. It's uh, bigger and badder than ever. And if you can play in this field, um, God bless you. Thank you, John. And. Uh... Another question that we had had is, uh, and we'll start with you, Charlie, um, and I know you're working on one now, but if, if you had to, uh, outside of maybe what you're doing at this point, start a new health tech company, a new medical uh, med sector startup, uh, what would it be? Or maybe another way to look at that question is, you know, what's, a, what's another big challenge that's kind of like itching at you to solve if, if you had $100 million and someone said go? Yeah, Chris, a, a great question. I think a lot of it depends on what strengths you as an entrepreneur and your, and your team can bring, right? And so if you grew up in the, in the healthcare space as a clinician, you have some insight that people like me, a software engineer, I don't have, right? Uh, I've been around big data and I've been around in, in many different industries, financial services and telecom and, and healthcare. But I kind of look at it from a, you know, how do we solve data problems? Whereas in, 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 in that's my strength and that's what, that, what I've typically gone towards and helping to enable clinicians rather than try to figure out the right next device. Uh, but again, if you're a clinician and you have that perspective and that insight, that, that is, you know, it could be areas where you want to focus because uh, there's plenty of, uh, of automation. I think the thing about healthcare that I think we've all recognized is that the consumer has entered the fray. Uh, it used, uh, granted, we still call them patients, but they're making a lot more decisions. The whole idea around high deductibles has changed the way financially we think about our medical bills. Uh, it's, it's, it, it, you've seen retail, the healthcare enter the retail space to some degree, and that isn't going to go away, go away overnight, uh, or go away at all. It's, uh, it's going to continue to change and evolve. So I think the areas that, uh, I think are most interesting for me, if I were to counsel someone think about starting a business is obviously the back office. We talked about David, John mentioned how important. Uh, reducing unnecessary waste in the system is. So back office and workforce automation, I think are really key. Uh, but the uh, figuring out how to connect with the patient as a consumer is something that if we do it well, it'll improve outcomes because it will get them more engaged. We'll do a better job at continuity of care. And I think companies that can think about that and bring innovative products to market around those spaces uh, can, be, can be leaders in the space. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, Margaret, would you like to kind of hop up on that one? Sure. Um, just as Charlie said, one should highlight, think about their strength. Um, so based on our strength, uh, we are the, among the leaders in gene therapy space. Um, as of the last eight years, we've launched five startups in the gene therapy space. Three of them have been acquired by large pharma or biotech. Um, this is our primary strength, and we expect to see continued growth and commercialization, innovation and commercialization in that sector. Uh, we also have uh, advances in cell-based therapies. One of our licensed partners was acquired by a large pharma, uh, by Sanofi. And just to circle back to the COVID discussion, uh, one of the technologies that has been licensed is um, using natural killer cells to address, uh, to combat COVID-19. So I feel both gene therapy and cell-based therapies are prime examples of personalized medicine. And these are things that we think that are ripe to have you know, more startups in that, in that domain. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, David, how about uh, yourself and what you're seeing at UH Ventures? 
Sure, you know, if the, if the issue relates to, to, you know, where we should focus attention from a, from a startup perspective, and we've alluded to this a couple of times, the most immediate lift and the, the, the most universal unmet needs when it comes to the delivery of healthcare is the business of healthcare. And uh, like Charlie, I'm not a clinician, so unlikely that without the right partners, I could, I could make a difference in that respect. So, so if I was to do the startup thing, Chris, I would... I'd probably start by probing a specific administrative domain very deeply. Do the insights gathering, get that voice of the customer, the, the consumer in this, in this regard, to Charlie's point, in order to appreciate the details behind the pain points. And then try to reverse engineer solutions that could reveal rapid return. And um, the quickest path to ROI is through the, the elimination of waste. And, you know, I would add that I wouldn't be afraid of looking to outside exemplars outside of healthcare, you know, to either replicate or reposition or partner with. Um, we run the risk, and we see this repeatedly, all of us on this call, this, this need to design a fit for an existing broken set of processes and, and interdependencies. And uh, I think we need to be intellectually honest that we can't continue to patch our way towards prosperity. You know, we, we need to think about how to perhaps shed some ego, think about how solutions have been tackled in other industries and perfected in other industries. And, uh, you know, then I'd end with, uh, you know, like Charlie, I would then, you know, my startup would then have a huge exit. So it was a simple story. Perfect. <laughs> e easy recipe. So thank you, David. Uh, John, anything you'd like to add on this topic? I think they answered, I'm, I'm just gonna leave it to the, all those sweet answers. Right. Totally, totally concur and agree. Awesome, well, terrific. And so we're, we're officially in the home stretch with about nine minutes left on our time together. Um, as we do, we'll, we'll, we'll do a, another uh, round robin of a, a final opportunity for a couple of things. One is any, for our, our four panelists, anything we didn't get to as we think about the future of healthcare that you'd love to leave as a final parting message to uh, all those attending from across Ohio. So that's kind of one. And then uh, two real quick kind of fun questions that we always do is what's your favorite place in Ohio? So we have people from different parts. So if you have family coming into town, where are you taking them? What's your favorite restaurant or you know park, whatever that looks like so we can all explore more of Ohio. Um, and then finally, a prediction for the future of healthcare. What is just something that you're looking forward to seeing, uh, you know, could be the next year, could be the next 10 years, whatever that looks like, but just something that you wish more people were thinking of and it was on their radar. This is, this is your opportunity now. And so Margaret, your top left screen for me. So we'll start with you. So uh, what, what, what do you got? Um, so I think again, for us, um, I think Ohio is doing a lot of great things, uh, whether it's Innovate Ohio, whether it's Jobs Ohio, uh, I think it's important as, as um, just to highlight one of our um, licensees um, who's a, a clinical stage Cambridge, Massachusetts based company, Sarepta, moved its gene therapy R&D headquarters to Ohio, to Columbus, Ohio. That we feel is a win to Ohio. And I hope that system is going to grow. Uh, and I think we're Innovate Ohio, Jobs Ohio, Bio Ohio, Rev One. I think everybody is on board and, and trying to create that ecosystem. And I hope that it grows in the future. Um, what were the other questions, Chris? <laughs> I, I kind of looped in a lot there. But, um, and I would say one of your favorite place in Ohio. So okay. coming to town, where, where are you taking them? Okay. Um, what am I, well, not one place, but I, I love all the, uh, the, the metro parks in, in Ohio. Um, one place uh, I took my family to, Dan the Baker. He has the best, best bread in, in all the places. And I'll leave it, to, and I'll stop there. Okay, well, th thank you, Margaret. Really appreciate that. Uh, we'll go to Charlie next. Uh, if you have a final, final uh, message you wanna share or something you're looking forward to in the future for, for healthcare. Yeah, Chris, uh, this has been great, by the way. You know, uh, I'll start with my prediction. We're going to beat COVID. Uh, I think most people figure we're going to do that, but it's just good to hear, isn't it? Uh, but I think, you know, it's going to leave us with some things as we look back over the last couple of years of 
great deal of suffering and loss is going to leave us with some new knowledge and, and perspective. Uh, we need to figure out how to take care of our frontline healthcare workers and, uh, and, and make sure they're supported as much as they support us. Again, I think technology can play a big role in that. Uh, I think uh, we're going to have to think about the deliveries of care and the channels that need to be able to be open so that we can take better care of our population, uh, not just in crises like this, but you know, we have chronic health diseases, which in and of itself are, are massive uh, crises. They just last over longer periods of time. And so I think the, the kinds of innovations I predict will, will actually accelerate because of all the, the trials and tribulations that we went through in the past uh, couple of years. So uh, I see blue skies ahead. Uh, in terms of my favorite place to go, and probably look up at the blue sky every once in a while, and we do get it here in Cleveland from time to time, is the Cuyahoga National Park. Uh, not many places people know that this region's got a national park. And I think to Margaret's point, she lo you know, loves the, the metro parks, which are kind of somewhat attached as well. It's just a great place to, I guess, as, you know, as we talk so much about technology and everything that happens around, to just kind of get out in nature and just disconnect. And that's really important innovation. So I'm just really glad that you know, in a state like this where we've been able to innovate, we've got this, this ring of nature around us to kind of bring us back every once in a while. That's awesome. Thank you, Charlie. Appreciate that. Uh, John, how about yourself? All right. As we wrap, as we wrap it up, you know, Chris, great job today. Um, Hope the uh, 60, 70, 80 people there on our call took away a nugget, one or two. Um, and of course you like imparted us with like three questions for two minutes. So um, I think that's cool, that's fine. Um, I'm gonna pile on with Margaret, you know, one of the um, roles that Ohio can play in the future of healthcare uh, well, maybe ba I'll back up. You know, I'm a trade association. We are, and I, I'm in the ultimate ambassador for all of you. We are a player. Um, we have been a player for 100 years. We remain a player. We are not trying to become California or Massachusetts or pick your device, you know, Minneapolis or bio in terms of maybe maybe Philadelphia. We're not trying to become anything. We are a global player. And I would like all of you to be an ambassador for us at Ohio X, at Ohio Innovation, at Innovate Ohio, um, anything having to do with Ohio. Um, you can't see if I put my video camera over here. I've got all Ohio stuff over here. There's some Bengal stuff, Cincinnati stuff, Brown stuff, Columbus Crew. Um, there's Jack Nicholas stuff. I'm about you know supporting Ohio. So we are a player. We have a great infrastructure. So you know if anything, I would say just be super proud of what we have. Uh, not whine about what we don't have. We're trying to you know because Shanghai and Beijing and Singapore have different things. Um, we, we just have a lot in terms of the future and we, we have a great, great infrastructure. Just reach out to us, anybody on this call, anybody of these uh, of this group from Cleveland to Cincinnati to Columbus to us, um, let us know. Um, sorry. No, that's great, John. And I do get I do get off. What's my favorite place? Yeah, there you go. Um, well, you know, cliche is wherever the family is, but I have to say, you know, I I, I love I love golf. I'm not good at it, but Muirfield Village Golf Course in Columbus, Ohio. Um, my parents grew up with Jack Nicholas and Barbara Nicholas, so I love uh, just the feel of Muirfield Village and. Actually, I love the feel of any great golf course. I think I have Pebble Beach on my sweater here. Um, just gives me a kind of a, a, a warm feeling. Um, 
And then I think your last uh, question, Chris, was about, you know, the prediction. You know, hey, uh, we, we, I think a couple, all of us have talked about it, home health care, okay? And that, that integrates AI, it integrates um, pretty much, you know, telehealth. Um, I've been crying about home health care for a decade because if you're in the diagnostic device area, well, you got to take that device out of the doctor's office and make it cool and colorful and have curves and small and miniature to put in your house that you want. That's that. There's like five or six different industries right there. Um, what an amazing thing. And that is the future. And then you add AI and stuff onto it. That's where I would uh, place my bets uh, going in the future, given what we talked about today and telehealth is uh, here to stay. So. Awesome. Well, thank you, John. And, and David, we'll wrap up with you. I'll make it easier. Any final thoughts? And then your favorite place in, the, in Ohio. Yeah, final thoughts will be, I'll pile on in terms of John. I think the, the coasts and specifically Silicon Valley are pricing talent out. And we're going to see an uptick in terms of technical talent immigration. We've just got to take advantage of that. And uh, perhaps we facilitate that with uh, increased collaboration between, you know, all of these world-class health systems in the state. And then all of these enablements, enabling mechanisms and funding mechanisms, the, the you know, the bio hires, the jobs are hires, the VCs, the jump starts, the rev ones, et cetera. I think we're on the cusp of a, of a great opportunity. Favorite place, um, everyone did land, I'll do C. I love the lakefront. I, I lived in Bratmore for many years, which is on the North coast. And uh, we, we're lucky to have a dynamic and uh, temperamental lake here in, in, in Cleveland and uh, in Ohio. It's probably because it's so shallow and there's nothing between us and Canada. So that would be my favorite place. Great. Well, thank you, David, Margaret, Charlie, John. Thank you so much. Thank you for everyone who attended today. Uh, also, thank you to Jobs Ohio for making this possible. Um, this has been an incredible conversation and a lot that I've taken away from it. So I, I thank you so much. And uh, if there's any, any final thoughts, we're, we're happy to wrap up and we'll see you all next time. Thanks, Chris. Thank, thank, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris.